Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to Sky Tour live stream for this wonderful. Oh gosh, it's uh, the 26th of February. I love it. Uh, winter's almost over, <laughs> so in a sense, that's pretty good. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that uh, we're going to be doing a evening of an in-depth view of one particular location, one region. If you've seen the previous uh, shots, you understand where we're going with that. Uh, but in addition to doing this, we also have uh, Daryl Mason with us. Hello there, Daryl. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm good. You? Hello, everybody. Yeah, Daryl's with us tonight, of course. And uh, we're going to uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in the Orion region, which I don't think I'll get too many uh, too many uh, you know uh, complaints about. I suspect. <laughs> Oh, Orion's so boring. Oh, nonsense. It's, I know, Daryl's just kidding, of course. There's so much going on in Orion, it's incredible. Yeah, my favorite constellation. Yeah, mine too. Mine too, you know, and that's that's uh, all par for the course. Uh, this, the star actually in our view right here, uh, this is Rigel. And in case you're wondering where I am, I'm right here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is Rigel we're seeing right here. Uh, and Rigel's a really uh, pretty star. It's actually a very hot blue star. And um, eventually, uh, Rigel's going to go supernova. Boom! And maybe we'll get to see it. Who knows? And we're all waiting for Betelgeuse to go at the opposite corner of the uh, constellation. But you never know. You never know. So I want to say hello to PNK. Keith is here. What's going on? Jessica S. Rockstar is with us. Daisy and Zoe Amethyst. And Ray Bobel, how are you? Donald Kunzer, how are you? Uh, and uh, it's nice to see you guys here. I know that Isabella is here too, from Sofia, Bulgaria. On a hot 77, Bonnie, how are you? And welcome. And I think that uh, I think there was there was one other person that I saw in here that um, Amos Amos Cardoza, how are you? If he's still with us, maybe he is. Uh, in any case, um, we are going to get cruising here, and what I'll do first is bring up our planetarium show here, our planetarium view, and we are currently at the constellation of Orion right here, and we're going to actually do something interesting. If you saw the, the mosaic I did the other night, uh, that mosaic was, I'll show you, uh, of the Horsehead region, it actually was this whole square area right here, right? That, that comprised six frames. And what we're gonna do now is this. We're gonna do this and do all this region now and see what happens, all right? So we're gonna start by going to uh, the Running Man Nebula first, all right? Can I, and, can I beg a favor, yes. please? Yeah. Can you back out just a little bit of Stellarium and show the people the constellation right under Orion's feet? You mean Lepus? Yes. Okay, there's Lepus right there. Okay. Lepus go is just... the hare, the rabbit. Uh, okay. Steal my thunder. Uh, oh, I didn't Lepus... know what you were doing. Well, yeah, that's Lepus. He's the rabbit, uh, the hare. And can people guess where his ears are? <laughs> oh, God. Jesus, Mark. <laughs> I, just... <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Carry on. There goes the mystery. Well, I All had right. no idea that's where you're going. Yeah, well, thank you for indulging me. Well, Carry actually, on. I kind of, kind of, uh, I didn't mean to steal your thunder, of course. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's focus on the matter at hand here. Focus? Is that a joke? <laughs> uh, maybe a little. All right, so we're going to go from Rigel up to the Running Man. And so we're using what's called high-precision slewing. Um, I've noticed that there are database errors, though, in the database that uh, is defined. And the uh, telescope's probably going to go to Cursa, which is over here. And when it goes to Cursa, and it is, uh, something is wrong with what it, where it thinks Cursa is. And it's probably not going to go exactly where we think it's supposed to go. It's probably going to end up down here somewhere. And that's because it's it's all messed up with Cursa. And I don't understand why. So we'll see what happens. 
So the telescope is in this little crosshair here, and we'll see where it ends up going. All right. So right now it looks like it's on Rigel, but it's actually on Cursa. And then it's going to move over. See, it thinks Cursa and Rigel. It's got those two mixed up. But let's see if it works. So see, that's where it, that's where we want it to be, right? But if we come in here, I bet you it's not going to be in there. Yeah, see, it's not in there. What it's going to do is it's probably going to be down to the southeast of it, down to the lower left. So let's go check it out. And there it is down to the southeast. So see, it has a wrong uh, coordinates for cursor. So that's why it does what it does. And so that that's one of those things that I've discovered uh, tooling around here in Orion for as much as I have uh, using this database. So all I have to do is go up to the right place. The telescope is pointing where it where where you think it's pointing. It's pointing, but the database and the the uh, movement to this object is not uh, proper, and that's just because it doesn't know where this star Cursa actually is. It has the wrong coordinates for it. Uh, if you notice, it ends up going down here, right? And um, so it it has. You know, if you go by the difference of where we're going, that's what it, it, what's wrong with it, its coordinates for Cursa. By that same that exact amount. So, numbers transposed what? or something, perhaps? The database has something wrong, um, oh. but it's not our fault. Our oh, telescope's it's... doing what it, it should be doing. It just has the coordinates for that one star that it's using as a uh, program finding star. Uh, it has the coordinates wrong. Some yeah. water. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, the telescope company does not have the rights to the software, which is kind of weird. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come over here, and I'm not going to bring Orion into the middle. I'll tell you why. Because we're going to start uh, right about here, and I'm going to actually start a little more, uh, a little more west. All right, a little more west, so we get the... Uh, more of the Orion Nebula in here. Hey there, Genghis. Uh, all right. <clears throat> nah, Daisy and Zoe, we are not lost in space. The telescope is pointing exactly where it should be, but the database that it's using to point to where it should be has a couple of mistakes, and one of them has to do with that one star called Cursa, C-U-R-S-A. All right, so right there, uh, what we're going to do is I am going to start from here all right so here's what we're gonna do tonight we are gonna do one minute stacks of this region and then we're gonna move over by the exact amount to this side to the left and do one minute stack and then go down do a one minute stack go over and do a one minute stack and then we can actually put that into one final mosaic of that whole region and then combine it with the horse head one that we did the other night and then we'll have uh, a large scale uh, composite. And let me just make sure. Okay, we had the top. Yeah, that should be just about. I'm gonna I'm gonna go north just a little more. So we have a few more stars that'll be overlapping for when I do the uh, the work to put it together. This is look at this. This is just a one second exposure. I mean, check it out. Isn't that beautiful? Let's just go exploring the Orion Nebula live in one second exposure uh, shot, shall we? Here we go. So we're going to move over. So here I it is. I can actually see uh, Bill Murray and the Baby Bill Ruth Bart. Such Ooh, a short Dad. exposure. I can't see that. <laughs> uh, it takes a really well, short exposure to see it anymore. It gets washed out so easy at F2. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's go to 66% to show more of the a basic nebula. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. I pretty also picture. noticed that there's not a, not a lot of wind tonight, so it looks pretty nice. But this is a live view. This is kind of cool, isn't it? You see all the color and everything. And uh, as Daryl has told you, as I've told you before, this bluish green color here, this is ionized oxygen, but it's ionized twice, so two electrons are ionized. And, and pushed off the atom because of the ultraviolet radiation from the stars in the middle here. And those stars in the middle, I can show you simply 
and I got a low gain on this right now. But let's drop the gain even more and see if we can show. There we go. There's the trapezium. There are those four stars right in the middle. Let's zoom in on those, shall we? It's going to look a little rough because we're actually not doing a stacked image, but a live image. Okay, so there they are. There's the trapezium right there. Really pretty. All right, and uh, we can go back out now to, say, our auto size. And then we'll increase the gain to our camera gain that we're going to use. And that gain is going to be a gain of 300. Nope, 250, I mean, sorry. 250, and now watch what happens to the image. You're going to suddenly see a lot more detail. Boom. Okay. So you can see more detail. All right. And now what we'll do is we'll set our time to uh, 60 seconds. But first, I'm going to come in here to the, to the telescope computer. And I'm going to set, set our parameters for the guiding system. And I got to get out of that. So I'm there. I'm um, going to change our slew speed to this. All right. 16x. Good. And now let's go in and drop down in our guider and change our rate for that. And I've been using a different rate. Um, all right. So... There's no wind, so we don't have to be so uh, demanding on our corrections. I'm looking at a monitor here, guys. That's the observatory feed, and this is the broadcast feed, so you might see me looking for two different places. That's two monitors. All right, let's set the declination right now, which is the up and down. Right ascension is the left and right, east to west motion. And all right, so there we go. Those parameters are set. <clears throat> now the telescope will guide, I think, very cleanly. All right, so now what we can do is come in here and... Hey there, one Nick G. How are you? Good to see you. I'll come in here and let's do a 60-second... 60-second uh, frame. And... Uh, this over here, I have this set right here, and that actually increases it. So you, it's like a, a hybrid view, so you can actually see detail in here. Uh, but to actually go in and start doing our exposure, I'm going to remove that so that we don't have this extra brightness that we don't need. And then I'm going to hit this button up here, which is the live stack. And the live stack is actually what's going to take the image we see and um, add it together, basically. So, first step is to clear it. All right. Which it is. Okay, and now we're doing a 60 second right here. You can see this, this green bar is progressing along, and this green bar is basically going to tell us exactly when the exposure will be done. And on the right side here, if you can read that, make sure you're in 1080p, by the way, guys, in your broadcast. Uh, this says seven seconds left, and now you'll see what a 60-second exposure looks like as we stack it. The first one's pretty noisy, and they get pro progressively cleaner. Here it comes. Oh, my gosh. Can you believe that's all there? And that's not even the half of it. If you want to see more of it, um, then let's actually just do a little processing for you. Okay. And let's do some color processing, too. Uh, first things first. Let me just bring this bar up here. All right, that's really pretty. And of course, as always, satellites. Uh, we get a lot of satellites. By the way, uh, just so you get the news, Starlink is in place and is operational out there, but it's not operational on our observatory yet. Uh, we need one more piece of hardware to do that to make Starlink operational out there, and that'll be showing up uh, fairly soon. But that's a big but. Huh? 
I said that's a big butt. Oh, I know. I agree. Always all something. Right. That's all right. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this, this vertical line here. This is our dark layer, like the blackness of space. If I pull that back a little bit now, come back a little bit, and it's gonna get much brighter, and you'll see detail out in here. Yeah, look at that. There's something right there. There's detail here. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's not bad. I'm, I'm actually quite pleased. <clears throat> Starlink was set up and put in place a couple days ago out in the desert uh, by the folks out there. And uh, it's great. And today I spent time trying to decipher what one particular kind of plug was that they were using. And get back, we went back and forth. And that, that plug is nothing like what we have. So I had to buy a special adapter from Starlink. And that'll be <clears throat> uh, coming out. And speaking of Starlink, <laughs> that guy right there is probably one of those. These guys here coming through it is this region here. Those satellites that you see, those faint lines, they're going to fade, by the way, over time. But uh, those faint lines are, are not those types of satellites those are probably ranging satellites hey calibos how are you starlink yes starlink's working man and not here though i don't have starlink here uh running yet um i i don't have starlink connected to the telescope yet uh we need to see starlink doesn't have an ethernet connection now and we need an ethernet connection and jude talaba is here hi honey how are you jude is a wonderful lady uh, she can paint planets like you can't believe. A real good artist uh, and a fantastic spirit. It's just good to see you here, Jude. Um, and she actually, you, you know her, Daryl? Yes, we've met a couple of times. You know Jude. Yeah, you guys met. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Calibos. We'll have the uh, Ethernet adapter soon and we'll be able to connect to our Starlink with no problem. Okay, so we've stacked four images so far and we're going to go to about uh hmm we'll see depends when these lines go away that's just such a tease i mean that's like going to a fine restaurant and getting to read the menu but not getting to order any food well the the other folks in the property are actually using starlink and it's like night and day for them oh i so, bet uh, <laughs> well, that's, we that's like watching your friends go to the restaurant and you having to sit outside. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then what do they say? Um, well, I was thinking of actually getting the, the, the faster Starlink. Oh. No, except that's $500 a month. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Isabella says hi, Jude. If you notice. I see it's that. So good to, that she came here. Yeah, no, Calibos. I, I, um, I'm quite convinced it's going to be uh, really good. Um, the other thing is, uh, Sky Tour Livestream, uh, we are currently in the process of converting the observatory to a 501c3 because we want to be able to, you know, take this astronomy educational outreach around the country or the world, and we want to do it by using our observatories, you know. Hey there, Michael, first of his name. How are you? Uh, Michael asks, are there any conferences you go to that have to do with stargazing? Actually, there are conferences all over the country. The Texas Star Party, uh, and there was Stella Fane some point, some time ago. But, um, and there's lots of, uh, of star parties around the country. Um, but um, we actually haven't gone to any of these star parties. And um, that's because we're a remote observatory. Um, now, we do have a concept where we want to carry uh, a portable observatory with us on a trailer that does everything you see here, but drive it all over the country and onto you know, college campi uh, and around uh, the country and just drive to different places. Um, oh, no problem, the, Michael. The local astronomy club... Uh... They have a big summer star party up in the high country here. All right. I used, to, I used to go to it when they were closer to town, but uh, 
they uh, in search of dark skies because their old site got light polluted so bad uh, they wound up buying a private site several hours down southwest of here uh, up in the mm -hmm. mountains uh, and that's where they do their summer star party now I've never been down there okay Skunk Ape Farm Off Grid says this is the star party right here you know what it's true huh in these COVID times, um, there's nothing like talking to everybody that you that you know, that is like-minded with you, and then seeing beautiful sights like this. This is live. This is not a photograph being brought up on a screen to talk about. This is live, and that's the part that I, I just for some reason I just can't get over that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm 2,500 miles away from where this image is being acquired, but I'm running it all from here on the East Coast. And this is out almost in the West Coast, in the uh, Arizona desert. So, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's just kind of mind-blowing that this capability exists, you know? I've dreamed of this capability. And, in fact, the telescope that you've seen behind me here in my office, um, this telescope is one uh, that... You know, I can just briefly show you the background here. I don't know if oh, it's in the dark. You can't see it. Um, but that telescope is our East Coast Sky Tour telescope. Um, so Sky Tour Livestream East, Sky Tour Livestream West. But this one is a... Uh, it, it's slightly different from the one in the desert. But it's also still a, a telescope that has a tremendous capability. And so we're thinking that because the Desert Telescope is so beautiful and has such a rich capability, um, <laughs> that maybe, <coughs> maybe uh, we're talking about adding another telescope. This is one we've been saying, adding another telescope to uh, the Arizona Desert. And then taking this telescope and, and making it part of our portable uh, observatory system. Uh, but that's down the line when we get some uh, funding, you know. And I don't know if we'll get funding. You know, you guys, the ones that have, you guys, some of you have donated to us, you know. And you know what? What you see in the screen is the result of those donations. Okay, we're here because of you. Okay, and that's something that I don't, that's not lost on me. <clears throat> that's why I like to spend the time with you, because you guys, uh, you guys have taken the time to spend time and money on us so we're gonna spend i am gonna anyway and daryl of course likes to i'm spending gonna spend the time uh with you because uh i'm always tremendously grateful uh of, of that generosity so all right so we have nine stacked here and the 10th is coming up and what i'll do is uh i think we'll uh 10 stacked a little more. A few more. The satellite trails that were through the middle are gone now. This one's almost gone. Yeah, hit those thumbs up, will you? Uh, I think that's uh, something phenomenal if you guys can do that. Help us trend. Help us get out there. Help us get the word. You know, I'd hate to see Skyter Livestream go away. I mean, who could... Who could put away such beautiful astronomical objects and then never see them again like this? Do you know what? There's nobody doing this. I searched online, and there's one observatory where an astronomer goes in and shows things kind of, you know, live, and it's like once a month. And he sits out there for a few hours once a month. And it's not even, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good location, but it's only for like an hour, you know? That's the Marianne's newest here. this that I've ever seen. Marianne Rob, hey. Hey, Marianne. Yeah. I was talking to Marianne earlier, um, and uh, she's having fun with her little... She has a relative she's got over. I don't know if she's still there. This is my Thai iced tea. I love Thai iced tea. Okay. This is the Running Man Nebula up here, guys. It's that blue object up there. That's a reflection nebula. That means that there's dust here and this bright blue starlight. Or actually, this it's roughly white starlight is actually 
hitting these dust particles, these dust grains in this cloud, but the blue part of the star's spectrum is being scattered. And that's why reflection nebulae are always blue. Okay. Um, so. This, on the other hand, is an emission nebula. The red part is hydrogen alpha. That is ionized hydrogen, glows red. That's what we're seeing here. Okay, powered by the stars in the center that are now blown out. And the green, the greenish blue again is the uh, doubly ionized oxygen that we're seeing here. Okay, we're gonna go in now and we've got 12 frames stacked. We're gonna pause this. All right, and now I do the next thing that you've seen me do. I'm going to save it and across the top of the screen you'll see a, a green bar. This is the .fits FITS file. That's an astronomical file format, but there's free FITS viewers that you can get if you want to just look at the files. But if you want just the pretty pictures, then I save it exactly as you see it here. Okay. And there did you go. Name it? And I want to make sure. Uh, no, I did not, but that's okay. If I name it something I don't want, then that's a problem. But I didn't yet. I did not. Okay. Know. You know what you do? Here, here, no, no, I got you. you you're right. I'm going to do this. I am going to say Orion, O R I, or no, Orion uh, 1. All right. What the hell? Why did you do that? Stop. Uh, no, don't do anything yet. I want this to be Orion 1. All right, and now I'll save it again. Yes, I don't know quite what it does, but I'm gonna then save it again so it'll make, it, it'll make its own directory out there. <clears throat> well, thanks for that, Daryl. So now what? there'll be an Orion 01 on the server. And in case you need to be reminded, uh, the server has these files uploaded um, within seconds of being taken they already start on their way up yeah <clears throat> yeah uh, Bonnie's in Colorado yeah she uh we were talking about that she lives in uh Pagosa Springs that's really nice down there mm -hmm. and she drove all the way to Centennial Centennial Wow. To, uh, to, for, to watch me speak. Uh -huh. And we got to be there. And, and, and you know, for all that drive, it was like, you're not just driving home. She's coming out to dinner with us. And mm -hmm. uh, they were very, very happy to have her go to dinner as well. So I thought that was really nice. Okay, live stack. We're going to kill the live stack. We saved it. There will not be a particular directory called Orion 01 out there. And now uh, we go back to one second and then what we're going to do is move the Orion Nebula that way out of the view and bring these stars over to here and then take a picture of what looks like blank sky all right it's not blank sky <laughs> all right so let's bring up our hybrid view I click this button and you'll see this, this screen gets brighter all right and now let's go eastward <coughs> Okay, and these stars that you see right there, these stars right here, we're going to bring over and leave them in the field of view. Alright. Okay. Hey there, James Dugan. How are you? Now see, James, James says he, he calls it the Parrot Beak. The Parrot's Beak. Yeah, I imagine he's talking M43 for that. Yeah. Isn't that uh, De Moraine's Nebula? Say again? Isn't that De Moraine's, uh, Moraine's Nebula? I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. All right. So now we're here, and 
uh, we're at a gain of 250. Our sensor is at minus 10 Celsius, which is good. And I'm waiting for the guide star. Okay, we've acquired a guide star. And now we'll take a 60 second photo here as well. Okay, and this one is going to be Orion 02. Now, this name doesn't come into play until I actually save it, so this is fine. All right. Hey, and now let's do a live stack here. This is the previous one. Clear it. And you'll see these stars will be over here now. <laughs> yes, Marianne, she's in Colorado, Pagosa Springs, she said. That's beautiful country down there. Yeah. Where is that relative to Denver? Uh, southwest. Southwest corner, as <laughs> you said, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see what this looks like. Okay. I see we have a number of satellites in here. Is that a tumbler? Or is that multiple no, satellites? No, I think it's, it's multiple satellites, yeah. Yeah, lucky us. We got multiple satellites. All right, now, this is to show you what's really here, okay? I'm, I've kind of exaggerated the view a little bit. And when I come out, check out all this dust. All right? Look at all this dust here. Look at this. This is why I'm taking this picture. Because there's all this dust here that we're going to be uh, adding together and making into a... Uh, a uh, mosaic. Isn't this cool? It's got at least four satellites there. I know. I remember a time when we could actually take pictures and have no satellites. See, and here's the four he's talking about. We got uh, one right here, one right here, and we have one here. And a second one here. So there's one, two, three, four satellites. You know, the two to the right are almost overlapping. Yeah, we have no idea. Like, actually, looking at the length of the trails, the trails look like their orbits are very close to each other altitude-wise. The length of the trail being, you know, determined by the time, the length of time we take the exposure. And... If the trail is very short, it means the satellite's moving slow, which means it's higher in altitude because the farther away from the Earth it is, the slower it has to move to stay in orbit. <clears throat> if it's actually closer to the Earth, it's going to move a lot faster. And in some cases, it'll go right through the whole frame in just in one 60-second shot. Okay? But this is 60 seconds to go from here to here. <clears throat> so these two satellites are probably about the same altitude, Maybe near each other in orbit. Maybe it differs by 50 miles. <gasps> Excuse me. Not bad, though. Notice this dust cloud is actually becoming more clear. And ah. it doesn't matter what we do here, uh, incidentally. Uh, it doesn't matter what we do here. It's actually going to... Um, uh, it's going to be a raw image that we process... Uh, the way we want to process it. So if I if I lighten up the background and let's see if we would do what's called a stretch. Let's uh, pull that data closer and see if we can actually pull out more data. Bring the dark back down a bit. Here we go. A little more. Okay, now you can see it a little better. <clears throat> Isn't this crazy? Isn't this crazy? I mean, this is just amazing. And the uh, basically, this is nature's light pollution. <laughs> you know, nature's light pollution. 
Uh, Calibo says, Mark or anyone reading this, who's excited with the James Webb Telescope? I'm really hoping they find evidence of life in exoplanets. Well, actually, <clears throat> I am sure that that is something that the James Webb was uh, in part designed for. I know it is, actually. And um, uh, the way it's going to do that is when it looks at the exoplanet atmospheres, it's going to be able to see them in a way that, you know, we have not been able to see with past telescopes, including Spitzer, because Spitzer was an infrared telescope. Hubble has an infrared telescope, but it's 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 a it doesn't go as far into the infrared as the James Webb does. The James Webb goes way the heck out here, <clears throat> actually up to twenty four thousand plus uh, micrometers, and that means that we're looking at uh, regions of the spectrum that Hubble cannot see. Uh, in this telescope, James Webb was designed to look back in time to the earliest galaxies because, and I've said this before, um, when we look at a spectrum of a galaxy, we, we see that it has, you know, spectral lines in it like we notice with other spectra. And the problem is that galaxies that are farther from us have what's called a higher receding velocity. What does that mean? It means they're moving faster away from us because the universe is expanding. The analogy I use <clears throat> is imagine blowing up a balloon to about the size of a softball and then putting black dots all over it, okay, all over it, and then blow it up. As you blow it up, the dots farthest from you on the other side of the balloon are moving away from you faster and from each other faster than the dots near you, near the nozzle that you're blowing into. So that is sort of an analogy of the expanding universe. And those galaxies farther away when those black dots on the farther side, the farthest black dot from you is moving the fastest away from you or when you blow up the balloon. That said, um, we see that as well with galaxies in space. Galaxies farther from us are moving faster away from us. And that means that their light is red shifted. Something moving toward us has its light blue shifted. And something moving away from us has its light red shifted. That is shifted toward the red. So you can imagine that if galaxies are moving faster and faster and faster, the farther they are from us, there might come a point where the galaxy's light information is entirely in the infrared. The whole light packet from that galaxy is shifted out of the spectrum that's the visible spectrum. Daryl's pointed this out with the Hubble Deep Field that some of those galaxies are red. Well, they're not really red. That's just that they're down near the red end of the spectrum. Their velocity, their recessional velocity, their, their red shift is starting to get up there. So you can actually see that their light is starting to head into the red pretty deeply. And you can imagine that it could go all the way. The farther they are, the faster they go. So Hubble could see to a certain distance to see galaxies a certain distance away. But unless you actually have a telescope that can look farther into the infrared, like the James Webb, then those galaxies will never ever be seen by anyone and yep. to this to this point they haven't been yeah uh called a cosmic redshift when they're that far away right mm -hmm, yeah one thing to watch out for folks uh, on youtube uh there are some sites uh some channels that purport to be showing web images already and uh yeah, not true no it's not true you're not you're not going to see any real images from web for probably three months, months. yet no. uh the only legit images by web already out there are where they're in the process of lining the mirrors all the other ones are uh i won't name any names but they're they're blowing smoke is what they're doing if they're they claim lying. to be showing legit web images already as yeah. Mark said, they're lying. Yep. <clears throat> so, the bottom line is that we just have to be careful about the news that we look at and the news that we uh, believe, okay? Um, about, like, what he said was, that, and this is something else, too. There's 18 mirror segments, hexagonal mirror segments on the web. Those 18 segments are all uh, reflecting light from the stars up to the secondary mirror, that, that focal point 
and then that light goes down through the center so it comes in hits the main mirror hits the second mirror and all that light goes down through the central hole to the sensor package at the back of the telescope where it's cold well each mirror right now is set up so that you can get and see 18 different images on the sensor at the back of the telescope because 18 mirrors are not lined to produce one image they're just a they're just opened so across the face of the of the second mirror you're getting 18 little dots because those those aren't converged into one yet you have to adjust the mirrors so that all that light converges at a point and that point is uh, the idea that is to make that one image out of 18 and that's what they do yeah. Okay, we're at 10 images here So we're going to pause this I'm Color mating op optics suck Oh, yeah, but when you can do it from a million miles away Wow I couldn't do that for this I had to go out there to do it Mm -hmm. You know, they can do it automatically, you know, which I thought was pretty cool. Oh, I mean, if I've I really wanted to. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I've said before, I mean, you know, I used to maintain lasers for a living, and uh, yeah. uh, some of them only had like three, op three optic, uh, optics in the train, and they weren't too bad, but uh, the worst of them had. Uh, offhand, I can think of seven optics, mirrors and lenses okay. and everything, and you know to get all those things perfectly dialed into each other, it's a royal pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. Okay, this has been saved, and now this stack is going to be cleared, and we'll go. Well, actually, before I clear it, I'm just going to do this and then come back we'll clear it after but I want to get I want to get these stars down at the bottom here down here I want to bring these stars up to the top to make the other part of our mosaic I bet so it uh, to... I'm sorry no go ahead I, I was just gonna say uh, at JPL or wherever the heck they're pulling the strings on web uh, to, to collimate a line 18 optics uh, somebody I bet's pulling their hair out <clears throat> yeah but I think it's uh, all automated well let's I hope think so. it's all automated okay I'm going to take this star right here and move it up to about there so keep your eye on that star Isabella brings up something interesting. Yeah, what'd she say? Uh, there was a picture out in the last day of an object on Mars that looks like a piece of coral. Did you see that? I did not. Sounds interesting, though. Sounds I like thought about want to see. sending you that earlier. I don't remember where I saw that now. I guess... Give me a second, I'll find it. If I find it, I'll, I'll uh, forward it to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here we go. This is now uh, our view. This brightness you see in the background, that's artificial. I'm, I'm, I'm really punching up uh, the brightness and it's just, that's just noise, right? If you really want to see it, it looks like, it looks like this. It's really dark there. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready for our next exposure so what I'm going to do is let it settle down let it find a guide star <clears throat> which it has and then we're going to go huh. do another 60 second shot right now Mark I'm going to uh, paste this into uh, you can look at this if you want or show it if you want it's a really fascinating picture I'll, I'll, once we get the photo going I'll show it alright so here's what I'm going to do I'm now going to start the 60 second shot Right. I'm going to go into the stack, get the live stack running, and get into here and clear this. Okay. All right. And now let's go see what Daryl's got. Come on. Yeah, I don't see.
see it there yet. Uh, drag and drop isn't working. I'm, I'll send you a link. Yeah, just put a link in the uh, chat. Very good. Yeah, just, just copy and paste the link, I guess. Okay, this would be Orion 3. <clears throat> there it is. It's in chat and uh, on the YouTube. Oh, in YouTube. Okay. Er, okay. And I'll... Well, I, I just pasted it to you also. All right. And okay. if I read that right, it was it was found by curiosity. Wow. So look at that. <clears throat> Another incredible batch of clouds that we see here. Stunning. All right, well, let's take a look at it, shall we? Let's take a look at what Daryl's talking about. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder if that's a hematite crystal. Um, let's take a look, guys. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is the object that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> these are undoubtedly those. Uh, these are what they call the Martian blueberries. Okay, these are really tiny. This is tiny. <clears throat> this could be a crystal. Uh, structure actually that was formed in the presence of water, which is why it might look like that. <clears throat> it's certainly not coral, but it's it's definitely mineral, and uh, but it could have formed in water. Uh, but I like that. That's pretty cool. It is. Anyway, thank you for reminding me, Isabella. Yeah, Isabella, thank you. That's cool. All right, Nito. Okay, so we got these beautiful clouds here again in Orion that we see. Uh, let's see about getting the color corrected a little bit. And maybe see what we can do. This might draw it out a little. And get this color correct. I think just about to here. I think that's that's color corrected. So what we do next <clears throat> is we bring out we bring out the detail in these clouds. Let me just this is called pushing contrast a little bit. Yeah, look at that. Wow. So once this is all together and merged and mosaic, you're going to see the whole region uh, with its with these clouds. And then we can link it to the other one we took with the horse at Nebula before. And that'll be pretty cool, too. If we just keep going, next thing you know, we just have the entire constellation of Orion in one-minute stacks. That'd be kind of cool. Almost like taking a piggyback picture back in the good old days, yeah, except right. you'd have a, have a lot more uh, resolution to it, I guess. Yeah, the, the, if you notice, then those of you that looked at the uh, mosaics that we put up, uh, I put them up on the uh, on the uh, server, so they're up there. Um, you can start scrolling in and zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. You can go in pretty deeply, you know, which is really kind of cool. The nice thing about this setup is it supports zooming in, which is something uh, that typically uh, yeah, doesn't really happen. You know, but we have a good sensor on this camera. It's a big sensor. You know, uh, this camera's sensor is over 4,000 pixels. Let me just show you the size here. Is it in capture profiles? Uh, no, it's in capture format an area hello 4144 pixels by 2822 that is a pretty big sensor pretty big Isabella, sensor. 
Isabella says, Mark, the images don't get to the server. Could be an issue with the names of the files again. Maybe I noticed that happening the other day, Isabella. And uh, what I end up doing is I go to this, I go out to, uh, I go out here to the to the computer, and I kick off the production. And if I kick it off, it's all, it works. I don't know what happened, but you're right. There is a little issue, so I'm gonna see about that. Let me uh, let me do this. Let's see what's going up. All right now, look at no. See, it's uploading the stacks right now. It's uploading uh, three of them right now. All right, these sync issues, those are just links, link files. I don't care about those. So it is uploading, uh, Isabella. It is doing it. We just have to give it time. Once the Starlink is uh, up and running, um, uh, for this, it's going to be just like phew, night and day. It'll probably be up there at, in real time. As soon as we finish, it'll be up there. Well, Starlink is going to be better, Isabella. You got it. She says, uh, well, just slow internet. Viva Starlink. You're right. <clears throat> So, it, that's the way it is. Calabos, <laughs> he says he's fluent in typo. Yeah, I think I am too. Okay, let's uh, try and do a color correction here again. Yeah. Well, they get a black... Uh, space sky it shows this reddish brown that might actually be the color because it would be dust mixed with hydrogen the hydrogen could be ionized um, and this nebula nebular complex is very close to us it's only about 1500 light years away only right well that 1500 light years is actually quite uh, quite close on an astronomical scale. Um, so, uh, we'll see that ionization can occur seemingly really far out from a nebula. But it's really not that far out because the ultraviolet energy can still ionize hydrogen out to quite a distance. For very distant objects, you might not see that ionization. Uh, like it may not look the same. This is a beautiful right here. Look at this little tiny thing right here. Look at that. Let's zoom in on that. We've taken a stack of eight right now. Now that we got this down to a veritable science, uh, we should be able to uh, check it out and, and do this more often. Okay, well, there it is. Look at that little finger there. Let me uh, see if we can... Let's see if we can actually darken it up just a hair. There we go. Wow. Uh, this this is at 100%. This is the native resolution of this camera, right? So we have all this to the right side, okay? And all this to the left side. And of course, up and down as well. The distortions in the stars, that has to do with the uh, wide field nature. However, when we do the mosaic, it, it, it's actually almost self-correcting. It's kind of cool. All right. These lines right here that you see, these are artifacts of the guiding process, okay? These are uh, pixels that aren't working on the camera sensor uh, for whatever reason. And so this is a blue pixel because you have an RGB, a red, green, and blue next to each other on the chip. And in this case, the green one's not working. In this case, the blue and another green one over here. And there's a few red ones that don't work. Uh, I had to tango, Isabella, because I just, hey, I just had a tango. <laughs> it's okay. I was doing a cosmic dance. That's why. So that's pretty cool. Actually, we can zoom out this way, actually. There we go. 
You notice how clear that cloud is now? Look how beautiful that looks. It's really looking nice. I think when we uh, put it all together, it's going to be pretty stunning. When we do the next shot, we're going to move this star over to here. And then all four of those shots, one up there, one over there that we haven't done yet, and one up there in the corner, all will be together to make a three degree by four degree size image. Okay, we are at 10. And we can let it get this one more, it doesn't matter. As long as we get to 10, that's that's the best. And now we're on Orion 3, and I'll save the stack, and you see it there, and then save exactly as seen, as always. Here we go. Oh yeah. Okay. And now what we'll do is, now what we'll do is we're gonna take down uh, the stack here, and that star gets moved over. Boom, go away, come down to one second. And yes, I know that we can do mosaics automatically with, with other applications. Um, I didn't see that question here, but I know we can, but I actually uh, don't, I don't need to do that. I don't want to do that. Okay, so this star now gets moved over here. Okay, here we go. We're moving to the west. I was talking about this star right here. Okay. Moving that star over. And we'll be underneath the Orion Nebula when we get here. You can see the Orion Nebula coming in now in the upper part here. beneath him 42 now correct yeah but I was actually it was over here before when I started so um, we might have a little bit of a, a break up here that I have to make uh, up for but that's okay Farba thank you so much it's very kind of you yeah I know you love us man you're great and you're more than welcome same goes for everybody All right, so we've got our, this is a, a beautiful region too. We're gonna see a lot more dust here. Okay, 60 seconds, we've got our guide star and away we go. And we start up the stack. It's Mark, nice being the only one. Excuse me a moment, this. please. Sure, it's nice being the only one on this, uh, this internet connection out there even though it's a slower connection. Once we get the, the Starlink uh, hardware, Starlink is running everything else out there. And by the way, I don't know if you guys remember, but maybe you do. This entire observatory is fully green. Um, our electricity comes from the sun, stored in uh, a lot of battery cells on the property that belongs to uh, the scientist on whose property we have this and his wife. And... Uh, they are full believers in being off the grid. They're completely off the grid. And thus the observatory is completely off the grid. And still, we can bring this to you. Isn't that incredible? You know, it's amazing how this all works. Okay, let's see what the first image looks like here. Wow. <laughs> all right, come on. Three cheers for the Orion Nebula. I mean, look at that. This is the lower part of the Orion Nebula here. Oof. Man, that's beautiful. Wow. This uh, right here is actually a little nebula that's really um, 
well, we can see a little bit edge of it. That's actually uh, called the uh, 13th Pearl. And uh, it's a tiny little nebula, which also, this, this it's got a white area around it with a dark, really dense, uh, dark nebula associated with it. And um, there's a hole there as well that you can see through to a spot behind it. But it's also got this subtle uh, reflection nebula right here that is part of this. And this is sort of an interloping uh, bit of dust up here in the foreground. And in the background is this other blue reflection nebula with that 13th pearl down here. So those are in the background. And this little guy is sitting over the front of it, which is kind of cool right there. Neato. Wow. I mean, I am, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's pull that full screen. Come on. Yeah. There we go. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I mean, look at that. Wow. Welcome to astronomy. This dark dust is nature's light pollution, right? <laughs> nature's smog. But it's stuff that uh, is actually very important. Those are uh, our little particles of, of silica, you know, silica cores that actually have ices on them, like uh, carbon monoxide, methanol, uh, carbon dioxide ice, water ice, uh, formaldehyde, um, and uh, they all end up. Uh, they all end up getting boiled off when they're in your hot stars and they go into the slurry of planet making stuff. And then in a solar nebula like our solar system formed in, you end up seeing this stuff uh, become planets. And then um, there's more than that too. Obviously there's, you know, there's aluminum atoms and titanium atoms and other things all floating around because they're made in the hearts of stars and they make their way out of the stars when the stars explode in supernovae and these are areas that are rich in these elements abundantly so and they go into making planets and stars you know all right and little little tidbit of fact that i don't know if you know when our sun was made it was made with primarily hydrogen fuel, right? And hydrogen is fused into helium. But that's not all that's in the sun. The sun has a huge number of different elements in its outer atmosphere and around its around the core. That outer atmosphere isn't doing fusion. It's plasma. You know, in other words, it's 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 atoms without their electrons, okay? It's just the proton cores the nuclei that are zipping around in these in the envelope the material around the core and out to the edge and that plasma that you see um, is just the atomic nuclei of these elements and these elements consist of things like magnesium uh, nuclei calcium nuclei all right uh, strontium nuclei and other nuclei but the Sun didn't make those elements it was made with those elements. It was made mostly of hydrogen gas, but in that solar nebula from which it formed, there was this titanium and calcium and potassium and magnesium from other stars that had previously gone supernova. And thus, when our sun was formed, it gravitationally condensed with hydrogen and started the fusion process. But it also had all these other elements in its outer atmosphere, which is there today. So when we look at the sun, we see that it has many, many, many spectral lines uh, identified by Fraunhofer uh, years ago, uh, centuries, cent two cent one century ago, 1800s, right? Did Fraunhofer do that in 1700 or 1800? I can't remember. I think 1800. I don't remember. Um, well, anyway, the, the Fraunhofer spectrum is all those lines that we see in our spectrum. So, um, and that those lines tell us the chemistry of the sun, you know, and they're like fingerprints. No other star would have those same exact chemicals in that same exact abundance 
unless, unless it was formed with us at the same place at the same time four and a half billion years ago. And down uh, in the southern hemisphere, there's a singular star we've found so far that has the exact fingerprint as the sun. And we know that that star was formed with us when they formed. And eventually we migrated apart because of the cluster we formed in moved apart. Um, and that, that, that star has the exact same chemical composition as our sun. Because in that nebula, this particular star as that particular star formed from the same materials that were in it. The same amount of titanium, the same amount of calcium, the same amount of potassium and magnesium, etc., etc. Okay? And so that's what we see. And that's how we identify our siblings. And so far we found one sibling. That was... Uh, James Dugan. It was over 200 years ago. Fraunhofer found the uh, absorption lines on the sun in 1814. Okay, so it was in the early 1800s. Okay, good. Hi there, Papa Tom. Hey, uh, Uberku, how you doing? Yeah, James Dugan said, Mark, is it true uh, that gold these three supernovae to be made? Uh, actually, uh, I see where you're going with that. Actually, um, gold is formed from merging neutron stars. All right? So, effectively, you need one star to have gone supernova to make it one neutron star. You need another supernova for another star to have two neutron stars, and then they have to collide. And when they collide... You have yet another explosive event. So yes, in a sense, it's three explosive events that would then create gold. Um, and uh, merging neutron stars is uh, a very um, interesting way in which gold forms. But the, the reason we, and, and the, well, the fact that we have so much gold in our crust means that we had a lot of uh, merging neutron stars. And Ronald is here. Did someone say gold? <laughs> That's funny, Ronald. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ronald is a gold miner in real life. You know? So that's pretty cool. Okay, we're looking at eight stacked. We're almost done with this. That's pretty, huh, Daryl? It is. I love this lower section here. I feel yeah. like I should almost... I should probably just turn this off for now. Just to be able to see it. Can you uh, go to Stellarium while you're stacking? Sure. We have one more to stack here, and then we're going to stop. It doesn't matter how many we stack. Yeah back out we're a little bit east of that location uh, I was okay. wanting to go in pretty much mimic your view just below the nebula all right let's do that all right well Actually, there it is I, uh, the name of the star directly below the nebula what is that Natsaya Hatsaya Hatisa 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 you're talking about this but that's the, uh, that's Hatisa, or Hatisa. Okay. I assume that's, that's the this star right here, isn't it? Yes, I think so. I was just curious what its name was. I never noted that before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's several. If we get a little closer. Hatisa. I think Hatisa. Yeah, I think it's Hatisa. Then we come back to our view here. Uh, and there's the other one. So yeah, that's the Tysa, and that's the other one, uh, the the Hipparchus catalog star that was there. Okay. Yeah. Learn something every day. I know. Look at this. This is beautiful. Good music for this. Calibos, no problem. I mean, this is just beautiful, isn't it?
I think there's some really interesting uh, stuff going on there to the lower left of center of the image. See some faint, down here? Uh, yeah, right there. The faint reflection nebulosity uh, kind of divided yeah, into two, and pearl. then. Uh, okay. So I think that this is an overlaying dust cloud, and this 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 reflection nebula around the thirteenth pearl is actually the same as this. Uh, but this is obscuring the rest of it right here, uh -huh. I think. I think that these and these two are part of the same thing. Are you still imaging that? Uh, yes. I'm going to stop okay. in a minute, but I've been requested to bring uh, this back on. All right. Isabella is our... Uh, she's actually kind of our note-taker. She... Uh, she's in Sofia, Bulgaria, and she's actually uh, too close to Ukraine for my, uh, for, you know, even though it's far, but closer than we are. Um, but this, uh, she takes the notes down, and then she writes our table of contents for us. She's really uh, quite amazing, and we thank her every single day for it. Okay, yeah. we've stacked twelve, so we're gonna get out of this now. But first, I'm gonna. Let's go back a little bit. Push this back. So I can see my telescope. Yeah. Alright. She's just a little southwest of where the troubles are. Mm. I do believe. Yeah. Okay, we're going to pause this now. And we're going to save this. We're going to save the stack now. There it is. And when I make this... Oh. I screwed up. Damn it. I was supposed to do this. <laughs> Orion 3. It's got to be Orion 4. It didn't screw up, though. It's going it, to... It, I can... Nothing's getting deleted. I just don't get used to this. It's very important to do it, though. I'm going to save it again, and it'll be in its right directory. <clears throat> Alright, so we'll just save it. Can we zoom in on on that area there above the uh, 13th yes. pearl before you move on? Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, we did our four panel uh, mosaic raw frames. So now we can have a ball doing other things. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay, so let's look down here. This is 100% now. And there is, there was, there is, there it is. Okay, there's the 13th pearl. That's this, that little reflection nebula. And this is like the little tongue that's over this reflection nebula. You can see it. See how no, this is obscuring that? That, that's like here, and the reflection nebula is back here. I think that's fascinating. It really is. There's a lot of There's depth. There's a dead to red it. pixel. Mm. You can see through it. And very so anyway, close to the 13th pearl, just below that. Uh, yeah. A little dark notch and uh, all that stuff right there going on. That's really complex. It is. It is. Actually, what I haven't done is uh, I didn't add the uh, the uh, default masking here to make it a little sharper. So I just did it. So now watch. Okay, now it's you can see it even more sharply. See, so it's a little more clear now. That's uh, very complex there. Yeah. We'll see what we can draw out of that. This this whole thing is complex. Look at that. Yeah. Really beautiful. You have to understand something, guys. Seeing it like this is something that was only uh, large-scale observatory uh, capability just a few years ago. Now, um, it's our capability. Not only that, um, 
taking these quality type, these kind of type of quality pictures uh, remotely was a, a pipe dream just a couple years ago, and now uh, we've kind of been on the leading edge of this. You know, there have been remote observatories for a number of years, of course, in fact, many, but. To do it in a ridiculously cheap manner, and that is to say, bring you so much capability uh, for so little uh, investment um, is what we're all about. And if we did this, if we had to do this on any other way, we could easily have spent fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. Instead, this entire observatory and all this was done for just over ten, and it's all because of you guys donating to us you know so that's what's really cool about this I saved this right I think I saved it Ryan before and I think you did a couple of times yeah I did I did yeah all right so for Isabella notice that the, um, the frames are still uploading right here to the server this is the upload process going on so I think we're covered <clears throat> so let's clear this and get out of the stack and now let's do another let's let's take our let's go up to 350 now for our gain and go to one second interval and then give our all right, we'll go into our what I call our finder view. Just give ourselves a nice hypered look here. Check okay. your gain again, please. Five seventy. Oh yeah. Well, five seventy is also uh, a valid one, but uh, I meant to do three fifty. Yeah, it was. Uh, you had a three thousand five hundred, and then it, it dropped <clears> to uh, <throat> oh the five hundred the the number. Oh, okay. Yeah, five seventy is the max. Yeah. Okay. The higher the gain, the more noise that is imbued into the image, and we don't like the noise. But now that we did this, uh, let's go here, and I'm wondering if we should do a, a, a good quality uh, panel for uh, the witch's head. Or maybe other things. There's a, there's other things to look at because of heights of witch's head right now. <clears throat> we'll do that. Um, we did a horse head before. Uh, and what is that? Did I lose. Uh, I did. Ooh, should we do a should we do a complete panel around uh, uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost? M78 into, into Barnard's, yeah, and into, into Barnard's loop. Like sure. That might be that might be pretty neat. Okay, let's do this first, and then bring in our our view. Okay, so that's what our view would be. So we would basically do this guy, right, and then we would do this guy into Barnard's loop then come down here into Barnard's loop and then come over here that might be pretty cool sure yeah <clears throat> I seem to we remember the seeing uh, really, yes. huh? M78 very recently Where'd you see it? From you, I thought. Oh, yeah. No, we did it, but we ne I've never done a uh, mosaic. Oh. Let's uh, see if there's something else to do a mosaic with, though. Since you saw it recently, let's see if there's something else. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Carry on, please. I just... Uh... No, it's fine. that's a fair comment, though. Well, they yeah. haven't seen it. Yeah, we'll probably do it. I just want to see. See, we got the rosette up there. Uh, but the whole rosette fits. Yeah. 
I actually don't know what's around the rosette. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen what might be around the rosette. Hmm. Okay, well, either way. Isabella suggests to connect the horse head with the Orion nebula. That's actually what we just did, Isabella. I, I just took that the horse head mosaic I did, and now what I did was a Orion mosaic below it, and those connect. They do connect, and we will connect them. Ha ha ha. So, good call. Oh, do Casper. All right. All right, we'll do that. We'll do Casper the Friendly Ghost and head there now. And it's probably going to pick Bellatrix, I think. <clears throat> Hey, Farva, thank you. I'm going to guess that's Bellatrix. Let's find out. Bellatrix, yep. Top right star in Orion. You have Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Safe. And then the belt of three in the middle. So it's going to center Bellatrix, and then it's going to run on down to uh, the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. And Bellatrix, I think, is correctly coordinate um, set up. So we'll actually be able to see Casper. And here it comes. <coughs> there we go. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to move it to the center. Like this. going to call this I didn't want to underscore uh, I actually have to call M78 I think I have I think I have M78 in here I'm going to call it M78 dash one alright and we'll I think there's some more of above that we're gonna leave it so hey dagger how you doing <clears throat> thank you so much it's really nice to see you okay this is good now we'll get our let me just do a zoom to 100 percent here just to check how our temperature focus is doing hmm. doesn't look terribly bad at all it looks like it's holding its own. It's a little soft to me. Yeah. Okay. Let's find out. Alright. So it gotta go down. Looks pretty good. Okay. What do you think? Ah, uh, it looks okay. Is uh, the pokes okay. are supposed to be uh, auto focusing right now? I mean, uh, you've been. It's supposed to be under temperature control, yes. Yeah. So it's 53.9 out there. <clears throat> so while that temperature stays the same, it won't change focus. So it's going to still be. At 809, it's going to stay at 47809 until the temperature drops. If the temperature drops, the focus actually drops. See, it went between 7 and 9 right there because it registered a micro change. But that's because the temperature reading was off a little. So let's minimize this. And as we zoom out, you'll see that it looks a lot more crisp. Maybe not that much more, but it's pretty crisp. Notice this dark area. This is all dark nebula in here. And if you have any doubt, it'll be gone once we do this 60-second shot. So this is 
M78-1 is the first in our series of panels to do a four panel shot of M78 over to the Barnard's Nebula, which you're going to see a piece of it right here. You can see a little red right here, right now even, and we're going to see that even better. So this is a 60 second photo. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> the green bar over there, the progress bar right here, tells us it's underway. And then I can drop out of our hyper mode because that adds to what we see. Um, but sometimes it makes it really too bright. So let's into our live stack, make sure that everything is cleared out, and it is. And I think our enhancement is good at 1.76. I'm going to change that. Make it 1.5. Okay. There we go. Okay, and then back to our histogram, which is our data. All right, we're almost, we're 10 seconds from this first exposure. So let's check it out. And we're gonna go a number of exposures. Then we'll, we'll go in and monkey with the colors and so forth. Ready? Ba-boom. Okay, so what we do first is we first take on the main color change like that. There we go. All right, there's Barnard's loop up there. That's that loop outside in Orion. And let's actually change the colors. It's not bad, it's a little green. Let's see if it'll color correct. Okay, that's good. So now we got the color correct. Okay, color correction underway. So there you go. And now, if you notice, this is looking modeled, right? Okay, so if we zoom in, you'll see it looks really kind of rough. Right, so I'll zoom in to 100%. That looks really rough. See all that color modeling there? Well, watch. Okay, we've got five seconds from now. It's actually going to uh, go to about half as much. Ready? So here it comes. Watch now carefully. Boom. Did you see that? It diminished by about half. And over time, it's going to keep diminishing because it's averaging out all that noise. This is noise. And the more stack uh, exposures we do, the less noise we get. The more averaged out it gets. Because this is data. This is the stuff you want to see. Even the faint, faint dark nebula. That's data. So that rises to the top and the noise is always down here. Right? So we're taking an exposure. Alright? And then we take another exposure and we align these two together so they're lined up and then put one on top of the other. And we just keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And that's uh, what we call a stack. Thank you, Farva. All right, monkey with the monkey. <laughs> Don't monkey with them. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll see this actually get an uh, improvement to uh, our, our view here really shortly. Let's go back to auto mode here. We've stacked uh, two of these, three of these now, Daryl. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is going to really be a really pretty uh, mosaic, I can tell you that. Let's actually kind of, let's kind of push this a little. Push it a little more. And then set our black level and see what it looks like. There we go. I'm pulling in the black level a little. Hey there, Zadarak, how are you? Pull that black level in. You may notice when I say the black level, that's that, that far left dashed line. I try to get it over the peak of the data. There's the, This is all the data coming in. This, this data right here. This is the sensor right here. There's all this data. RGB, red, green, blue. And um, to the left, all right, we're coming, the, the peak of the, the peak actually is the peak of the data. So the black should be at the peak of the data. And as you can see, when we do that, look at the view. Look at how beautiful this looks when we do that. You know, so it's actually quite, um, quite a nice, uh, quite a nice uh, uh, rendering, I should say. 
of these colors uh, especially when you match the uh, black to where it has to be you look at the telescope it's pointing just a little bit to the southeast right now um, it looks good a lot of fine uh, dark nebulosity in there yeah look at that both above Thanks, and below Lana. Not down here, huh? Yeah. This is an All extremely through. complex region. I'd love to get a nice high focal length view of this area right here. Renee Cruz is here. Hi there. How are you? Good to see you. <clears throat> All right, Petita. That's PG, folks. Petita, answer a question for me. You're on the spot now. Have you started reading The Populated Universe? That book you got from that nerdy, geeky astronomer at Pine Bush uh, UFO Conference a year ago. Come clean. Have you started reading the book? Right now she's smiling. Oh, no. <clears throat> okay. Wow, this is really nice. It's a beautiful night out there in the desert. Oh, just that, uh, the fine, wispy, dark day we lost it. That's just amazing. I hear you mean in this, yeah. Oh, all of it. Uh, up toward the top on both the left and the right. Yeah. Uh, that okay. and... And look at it, it. It joins with the Barnard's Loop. Yeah. Then to the right also, the upper right. Yeah. Look at this object. Yes. Hey, Isabella. What do you think you're doing? I asked PG a question and you said PG say yes. I'll back you up. Really? Really now? <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, notice she hasn't answered me, Isabella. Solidarity. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, Isabella. I, I got you, Isabella. All right. Solidarity. All right. So you say. Okay, there we go. I did a little more color correction to what I know the colors are. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Uh, this is a reflection nebula in here, guys. A lot of dark dust, as you can see. And this dust has got a little bit of a reddish tint, and that's because it's mixed with hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is being ionized by hot stars and glows red. There's more of it over here, so it glows more red. This red, and probably some of the red in here, is part of an ancient supernova remnant that occurred uh, in, in probably in Orion at the time um, and expanded outward. And... Um, the Orion region is full of star forming uh, uh, processes and so we know that there are very hot young stars that have gone supernova there uh, soon to be and in the past and um, you know for instance uh, the three belt stars of Orion O stars Al Natak is an O type star the hottest and bluest of all kinds of stars you can have so what's its fate it's not going to go quietly. It's going to go with a massive explosion. Betelgeuse, just a few tens of thousands of years ago, was actually a hot O star, a blue star. But it expanded into a supergiant over a few tens of thousands of years and ended up becoming a star that uh, looks red because as it expanded, those outer areas got farther and farther from that hot core. When the temperature drops, the color goes to that hot blue down through to white, all right, and to yellow, and to orange, and then to red. 
So the outer layers on the star are only about 3,000, 3,500 Kelvin uh, in temperature. So uh, now the star temperature in the core is still many millions and millions of degrees. Uh, a, you know, a million uh, Kelvin, I should say, many million Kelvin. But the uh, outer layers so far away are cooler and thus the star looks redder. But make no mistake, it's not going to go quietly. It's actually on its way to supernova if it hasn't happened already. Okay, this is our tenth one right here. So, oh, this is a beautiful image. My God. It is. Probably one of the best of, of this region that we've seen. We're going to pause this. We're going to save it. This is M78-1, as you can see. All right, there it is. The FITS file, our raw file. And we're going to save it exactly as seen. All right. And now, I hate to clear it. I just let, Let's just look at it again here. Let's, I let's think you should in. zoom in on places. I agree. Let's go to 75%. Wow, look at that. Let's go up first. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This is such a neat little area. That's almost like a bubble. With a red... Uh, it has a red tint around the outside. I'm wondering... I'm wondering what's caused that. Is it this star or is it something else? Hmm. We'll have to see. There might be more to this than that. I have to check that out. We come down. <coughs> We've got this beautiful, wispy nature. There's two stars here, but they're just blown out because of the nature of how deep a view we're trying to get here. Um, then down below this, we have a very, very complex set of filaments and stars within the dust that we can see. Stars that are fully in the dust are going to look more red because their light is reddened by this dust for the same reason that you get a volcanic sunset when there's lots of particles in the air. The sun looks much, much more red. Okay, and that's kind of what we're seeing here. Look at that. That's amazing. Wow. I can't imagine, you know, before I actually had this collimated properly, I used to think the images were pretty good looking. Then after collimating it, it just stunned me with what we were getting. It's like, Whoa, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Something else. Yeah, like a quantum leap. Yeah, like a quantum leap, yeah. Oh, Isabella, thank you for putting up our book. That's very kind. Yeah. Perhaps there's That's another right. quantum leap in your future. Maybe. Maybe. I'll rasa you to the finish line. <laughs> This is um, nothing because you couldn't see it. Um, but actually, what I was getting at was uh, what Isabella put up is this is the book, The Populated Universe. Life in the Universe may very well be the rule, not the exception. This is the mid range version. There's a, there's a, uh, this is a black and white uh, illustrations and pages. Um, I did a lot of the artwork myself because um, I'm also an artist. But, um, that's the that's the smaller version of the print book. Uh, the larger version, the eight and a half by eleven size version, uh, all color, all color illustrations. I just didn't want to skimp on that. I make so little on these books; it's incredible. But that's okay. I don't mind. Uh, just want to get the word out there. Uh, you can also get it uh, as a, a Kindle book uh, or a, a electronic version that you can read almost anywhere as well. Okay. Thank you, Farva. Let's uh, go down to one second again. I'm going to have to uh, get rid of our stack here. I saved it. That's M781. Let's get rid of that. We'll clear it later. And before I do this, I'm going to rename this properly. M78-2. Alright. And we're going to move these stars over to this side. 
There we go. All right. And now, let's move these stars over. The stars on the left side will be on the right side. There we go. Okay. My tea's gone cold. Excuse me just a second. Alrighty. That's cool. Alright. So right now you can even see the red of Barnard's loop here. And when we do this image you'll see that really clearly that it's there. <coughs> Cool. This is neat. Okay. We're getting our guide star. Are you guys having a good time? I hope you're liking it. Because I really think this is cool. So 60 seconds now. And thanks for sitting through this with me, guys. I'm really happy that you're here with me on this. Okay. And now our live stack. So I can show you right where this comes up. These stars are now over on the right side. So we're going to be catching a lot more stuff over here. So first things first, we're going to clear this now. And this will be M78-2. Your tea warm now? 78 2. I'm sorry? No, I switched warm to now, water. You? I switched to water. Okay. <clears throat> North is up, Ronald. Uh, the right side is actually to the west. But yes, it is. It, to the right is west. So imagine the telescope looking in the sky. If you look to the right, you're looking toward the west. If you look to the left, you're looking toward the east. And the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's because the earth is rotating which way? Toward the east. In order to make the east rise and fall. Oh, look at that. Look at Barnard's loop, Daryl. Uh -huh. this, this segment of Barnard's loop looks really beautiful. Wow. That is so cool. Look at that. Look, got a star cluster in there too. A cluster and a satellite. <laughs> okay. This is so cool. Well, let's uh, let's let me let's color correct, but it won't do much because this is actually pretty close to what it should be. And then let's actually do this. Okay, so that makes it a little more subtle. It's not pushed as much. If we do this, it'll be a little more pushed. Okay. Wow. I'm... Barnard's loop is actually pretty faint. And the fact that we found it is, is like this. It tells me that I think we're going to have to do, uh, at some point, we're going to have to do a mosaic of Barnard's loop entirely. That's a, that's a big, big project. Hey, Michael McCall. Thanks for coming, brother. Uh, we'll see you later. Wow, that's really pretty. Two stacks so far. Does uh, Stellarium show Barnard's loop well? Uh, let's go find out. Stellarium, come up. Okay. Um, we're here right now. Shows something. Let's see if we zoom in if we get a little clearer. Yeah. Well, and this is NGC 2112, which is the cluster you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty dim. So we are. Uh, yeah. When you see Bernard Loop there, folks, it's a, a good portion of the size of the whole constellation uh, over on the left hand side, in particular. As Mark said, that's a supernova remnant, and uh, if you follow the rough idea of, you know, following the curve and imagining the circle and where the center of the circle must be to be where the supernova was in the past, roughly, uh, 
it's down toward the Orion Nebula. It's not quite to it. Uh, and that whole hotbed of stuff going on there that Mark's circling yeah. around uh, yeah. Sigma Orionis Somewhere and the horse here. head and the uh, Orion Nebula and all that. Uh, something big went yeah. boom there a long time ago and blew that big, uh, big red ring out in space. And could have been responsible for all of the stellar formation going on in the Orion Nebula now. That's true. In part. Let's go back and see what we got here. My oh my. That's quite How a beautiful. start. How buster. subtle. Yeah. Yeah. NGC 2112. Yeah, actually, we should look at the whole view here because we're, uh, want to do it this way. This is, this is the auto view. This is fully fit in. <coughs> yeah. Nice. <coughs> While this is doing it, can you excuse me for one second? Sure. I'll be right back, guys. Just gonna get something to drink. I'll be right back. Hopefully I can keep you all entertained while Mark is gone. Ronald, we had several nights of below zero temperatures here. It got down to uh, nine below zero Fahrenheit. That's without wind chill. Uh, we had wind chill of minus 25 uh, at least one morning. Uh, it was the last storm that passed through here a few days ago, which is presently to the eastern part of the state again if it hadn't blown through already. And some places up in the high country got about three feet of snow. Didn't get that much here. It never seems to snow that much here. Knock on wood. Yeah. My elevation, I'm about 6,200 feet, roughly. Uh, maybe a little higher than that. But I remember at the center of town is 6,200, and I'm a little higher than they are. When you see Pikes Peak just elevation. west of town, it's uh, 14,115 feet. Welcome back. Hey, for sure. Wow. Well, the observatory in the desert is uh, at about just under 2,000 feet elevation. It's not really, really high, but it's in the desert, and the air is clearer out there, and the sky is blue. Bonnie's at 7,500 feet. Mm-hmm. I was at uh, 10,000, maybe 10,500 when I lived uh, up on the east side of Leadville, way up, and some guy was posting on uh, Reddit the other day, uh, he had taken pictures up in the high country here, uh, he took one up on top of Boreas Pass, which is uh, southeast of Breckenridge, and that was... Uh, uh, 11,000 something, I forget how high Boreas is. I think that Boreas, I believe, is the highest I, I ever observed from. Wow. And probably the coldest you ever were <laughs> observed. Uh, it was summertime at the time, oh. but still being that high, yeah, it was rather cool out. Was it 75, 70? Oh, at night? Oh, God, no. Uh, no, 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 no. At night, it'd be cooler, but, um, you yeah. know. In the daytime, you mean? Just... Yeah, in the daytime. I was wondering what it was. Uh, that high up, uh, all in Leadville, uh, the hottest I probably ever saw get in Leadville was 70 degrees of fat, mm -hmm. but uh, if you're out in the sun, because you were so high up, over 10,000 feet, the intensity was so great that, uh, I mean, if, if you were out in direct sunlight, it felt like over 100 degrees, but the actual air temperature was like 70 or less. Gotcha. Anybody have any questions? Hey there, Blues Traveler. 
if you have any questions, uh, feel free to toss them out. Okay, we're at eight stacked here. M78-2. Don't forget that thumbs up, guys. All right. Which direction are you moving next? Straight down. We're gonna put this star here. Right up there, right near the top. Okay, we'll, be able to, like, we'll be able to align on these stars for the next frame. Aspen in springtime, Ronald? Uh, springtime is when winter really shows up here. Uh, the biggest snows I've seen in Colorado were, uh, well, even down here, the biggest snows I've seen were October and April. March and April is really when snow season starts here. Yeah, we're looking forward to being done with winter. It's just getting started here. Mm. There's an old saying here, uh, Colorado, winter's in spring, summer's in fall. Falls in winter and there's no spring at all. <laughs> we funny. generally we get to late spring and it just goes from too cold to too darn hot mm -hmm. directly. Okay, M78-2 is done. We're going to save it now. And we're going to save this exactly as you see it. Alright. And then miss this opportunity to name this properly now. We're going to do M78-3. Uh, no, actually. Let me clear this first. Because I don't want to make a directory that I don't need. ourselves that hyper view we like so much now let's take this star and bring it up near the top and that will constitute the next version Siri <laughs> see cool stuff coming in when we do that Barnard's loop in here as well. It'll be a little more to the east on us here, but that's all right. All right, that's good. And now we will go back, set our 60 seconds. And our telescope is finding the guide star. It takes 11 seconds. So we probably have it now. So I'll come out and I come out now and get into our live stack and wait for the first data to come. This is a lot of fun. Oh yes. Wow. It's as high as 27 there. Daisy and Zoe Amethyst. It's a toasty 27 outside. <laughs> uh, let me check the what's going on here, Isabel. No, let's look at if you look here. It's 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 uploading actively. So they must not be there yet, but they're uploading actively. Let's wait and see what our first one looks like.
three seconds, two, boom, and, oh, look at that. That's really pretty. That's going to be a nice continuation of Barnard's Loop for us. And then we're going to, when we do the next set, we're going to move these two stars over to the left side. Okay, and we can see some dark nebula in here, probably from that other complex. That's going to be nice. Hey, Jessica S., I was actually, uh, I was driving with uh, someone in uh, Colorado, uh, Katie Grabowski, from MUFON, because we were going to a uh, talk, <clears throat> and uh, I noticed indeed that there were no uh, guardrails in a lot of places. Dean Bostador, how are you? PG, are you saying that that's why you haven't read the book? Because you don't want to read the book? You want to hear the book? I'm waiting for the uh, for the uh, audio version of my book. I have someone doing it. And her voice is just... It's velvety smooth. It's really a beautiful voice. <coughs> Ronald says you just gotta drive and keep in your lane. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess um, without uh, without any guardrails. But Ronald would know because Ronald drives 22 hours from where he lives in Minnesota and comes out to uh, where we are in Pine Bush. I'm not there now, but I'm I'm in Connecticut, not New York State. For the Pine Bush uh, Museum uh, UFO uh, conference, he drives out. Oof. 22 hours. Last year it took him 30 hours because he got lost. His GPS kept turning him in a circle. <laughs> Which, you know, I don't mean to laugh, but it's funny as heck, Ronald. What can I say? You know, I can't believe he didn't figure that out. I mean, how many times you have to see the same donut shop to know that you're you know, going in a circle? Wow, well, there's a lot of those donut shops here. <laughs> you know, the same people in the cars outside. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding. I don't know this specific. <clears throat> Why'd you leave Leadville, Daryl? Daryl, I can't hear you if you're talking. I'm sorry. Uh, why did I leave Leadville? The yeah. mine shut down. <clears throat> oh, so you're saying you had the... This was at a time when you were still uh, working and not retired? I'm sorry, you're losing me. Uh, you said when you were... You left Leadville... Because the mine shut down. I left, left Leadville in 1984. Okay, I'll say so that last were part still again. At the time. I said that's why you were still working at that time. Right? Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure I follow you. Uh, I left Leadville in 1984 because the mine just shut down, and it was just getting too hard to live up there. I moved to Colorado Springs in 84. I've been here ever since, and I retired in uh, 2016. Oh, okay. So you, you were in the Springs for a long time then, before you retired. Oh, yeah. I Well, hell, I've been here since oh. 84. All 38 <laughs> years, I guess. Okay. Wow. And what's sad is, you know, Daryl has said how in the beginning he actually had beautiful Milky Way. You can see the Milky Way from where he is, and, and now he can no longer see the Milky Way. Well... It should be uh, from where you are. Yes. Right? Yep. Uh, I could see the Milky Way when I first got my house, 
and uh, I mean that's been over 30 years now uh, and uh, the town has grown up around me the uh, the size of the springs has more than doubled in the time I've been in Colorado mm -hmm. uh, uh, the town and the whole state has more than doubled in population, almost tripled. Wow. And light pollution is a big part of it. It's one big reason I liked living that. in Leadville so much. Was uh, It was a small mining town. It was a few thousand people. I was high up on the hill uh, above the east edge of town, and I just had the uh, most beautiful dark skies up there. And it's changed even in the high country now. The skies aren't what they used to be up there. Well, I was going to ask you, how's Leadville these days? <clears throat> uh, it's become a bedroom town for the ski country. When I lived there, it was a mining town. and They didn't mind tourists, but uh, Leadville was not about tourism. And it was not about skiing. It was a mining town. And... Uh, uh, when the mine shut down, well, people figured out which side their bread was buttered on, and the, everybody went to work in the ski areas, and uh, that's pretty much what Leadville is now. The big mine has reopened up there, but it's nothing like it used to be, what I gather. The mine what? I worked at at the this, time. Is this molybdenum? Yes, the Climax mine. It sits molybdenum on top. Mine, right? Yep. Molybdenum, Climax mine, sits on top of Fremont Pass. It's at about 11,000, I forget, 11 something. Wow. I'm trying to remember. I was driving, I think it was with. <clears throat> in Arizona, actually. And. It seemed like we were going through a whole area where there was just huge, huge mines. You know, miles long. Yeah. You were driving by the sides of this open pit mine for miles. Um, so there's a lot of really, really big mining country out there, too. Oh, yeah. That's what much of the West was based on, <clears throat> mining. Mm. I don't think Marianne is still here, but she could tell you the name of that mine that we drove by. I'm sure she remembers. Hmm. Marianne Rob, are you still here? Paging Marianne. Paging Marianne Rob, paging Marianne Rob. Just one little information about the mine. What's interesting is Leadville was up above over 10,000, you said? Uh, Leadville's official elevation, if I remember correctly, which would have been uh, at the uh, town hall probably, uh, 10,152 feet, if I remember correctly. Wow. So that means that the deepest spot in that mine was still higher than Denver. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So if the deepest uh, at the, part of the mine went... Go ahead. The mine was, uh, again, up on... It was on and above Fremont Pass, which is at 11,000 several hundred feet. I forget how much... Uh, the deepest part of the mine was about a thousand feet underground from there, so okay. I mean, the bottom of the mine wow. was still well over 10,000 feet. Wow. Okay, M78-3 is being done now. It's finished, and we're going to do the last set of frames here in just a minute. We'll save these exactly as seen. Okay. And now we can clear this, and we're going to move these stars, these stars, over to there. And we're going to get rid of this, and do this last panel. Just this one second shot here, and do our hyper view. 
Boom, there we go. Hey, it was just there. All right, there we go. And now uh, we're going to move, oh, wait a minute. Gotta get out of there, okay. These stars go over to this side. So let's go now toward the west. I have often oh, wondered how. Did? What's that? They let it flood. Uh, <clears throat> they did. Uh, I haven't been up there in a few years now. It's gone over Fremont Pass, but uh, there's a turn off side of the road there, and you can see all the above above ground portions of the mine, and then the newer underground section was down the hill from the top of the mine, uh, top of the pass on the south side and uh, used to be huge infrastructure up there everywhere and okay. the last time I was there they had torn down everything uh, wow. at the old underground site it was just gone and there were like yeah. I forget 170 or 200 miles of tunnels up there and uh, they wow. just they just it was a city underground climax was the second largest user of electricity in the state of Colorado and uh, wow. they just they just shut it down, turned off the sump pumps, and let it flood. And now what they're doing is uh, they're open pit mining up off the top of the pass. Wow. I wonder, I wonder how many, how many uh, years it took for that to flood fully. Uh, good it's question. Months. I don't know. Okay, this is. Stop here. And let's go a thousand milliseconds. We're gonna go to sixty seconds here. This is our last frame. Then we're gonna change the name to M78-4. I'll do that now. <coughs> Hyper mode, bring up our stack, and we are golden now. Let's see what happens. Three thousand people in the eighties, huh? Yep. That's a lot of people. Early eighties. That's just well, a few less than the aircraft carrier. No. It was uh, one of just a a few molybdenum mines in the free world back in the day, <clears throat> and uh, then they started opening up other new mines, uh, one big one in New Mexico and others mm -hmm. elsewhere around the world. And uh, they had a monopoly at one time. Wow. It was quite the operation though. There is a cool book about the history of Climax. Wow. It's uh, written by a guy named Stephen Boynick. Leadville or Climax was the first place to have cable TV in the state of Colorado. Really? Yep. They, uh, there was Lookout Mountain <laughs> west of Denver, which is where all the TV antennas are or were. And, uh, yeah. on top of uh, Bartlett Mountain, where the mine was, uh, they had a line of sight to, uh, 
Lookout Mountain, so they put up an antenna up there and uh, started picking up signals off Lookout Mountain, and then they run a cable down to town, and uh, Climax used to be a town. It was a company mining town. And okay. they ran they ran the TV line, cable line, down to town, and that's how people in Leadville, or people in Climax, watch television. Wow, that's pretty cool. So this, I can push this now. You can see those beautiful filaments up there uh, of Measure 78. What you're seeing down here, this is actually close to the Flame Nebula. Uh, next to Alnatok, which is out of the shot. But you see all this additional dust is in here. This is crazy stuff. This is beautiful. Wow. Isabella, oh, go color. for it. Yes, please ask crazy cosmological questions. I'm not a cosmologist, so all I have is an opinion. <clears throat> Same here. Hey, Justin T. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Justin. Justin T, just in time. Okay, we have three stacked. This will be soon to be four stacked. Here we go. All right, Isabella, we'll wait. <laughs> dun dun dun. <laughs> Funny, Jessica. Lewis, what's going on, man? Lewis Ta is here. All right, what's the easiest question? Particle from our universe enters another bubble universe by quantum tunneling, for example. Will it continue to behave by our laws of physics? Oh, that's a great question. Or will it obey laws of other universes? Well, um, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, and that is to say that we first have to identify other universes to know what the physics is that applies to that universe. There are many theories about what physics applies in alternative universes or parallel universes, if you will. And uh, we could have the same physics or we could have physics that doesn't allow uh, atoms to combine in a certain way that would allow for life. Um, you know, and so <clears throat> that said, um, we don't know the answer to that question, Isabella. You know, it may or may not, and that's uh, actually remains to be seen. We have to find one of these parallel universes to know. Daryl, you want to take a stab? Go for it. Uh, from what you said, uh, not only do we not know, we cannot know by definition. It's outside our universe. And I right. would I would say, being outside our universe, by definition, we cannot know what the nature of the other universe is. And you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment to say uh, there is um, there is there is such a thing as um, uh, theories as to how universes are laid out, and actually evidence that there are parallel universes. But what does that mean? Parallel universes means that you can either have a layout where all the universes are in the same place physically, but differ by dimensional uh, arrangements such that you can't really directly interact with other universes, but they're dimensionally in the same uh, in the same place, but in different dimensions. Uh, that said, um, the other theory is that there are universes that are next to each other. And that's something that's called the soap suds theory. And um, I, I kind of lean in that direction a little bit. I'll tell you why. Because soap suds, the way soap suds occur in a, in a sink uh, is a natural occurrence, right? It's a natural occurrence. When you 
spray water in a sink full of soap, they get these suds, right? If you look closely at the suds, you'll notice that the suds on the interior of all the other suds, because they're all throughout the froth, right? They have flat sides. They all have flat, faceted sides. No curves. The only curvature is where there is uh, the uh, curvature on the outside portions where the outside edge has to curve because the law of minimal surfaces applies out there, but not interior. In the interior, they have all these flat facets. So uh, our universe could have a variety of universes could have a variety of shapes. Those facets aren't all laid out the same way. You can have some long, thin facets, some square facets, tra trapezoidal facets, etc. Depends on the layout of the quote-unquote suds. Each sud is a universe. Uh, so that is something that's really interesting. Um, so is it a soap suds universe, or is it a parallel universe where everything is coincident? They're all in the same place, differing only by the dimensions. Um, and I'm not sure which I uh, which I believe okay I think there's actually evidence for both uh, but it's it's hard to hard to hard to know because we as Daryl said we cannot know we cannot see outside of the universe but if we're near a facet if it's a faceted universe we're near a flat facet from the edge of our universe at some point we could see that facet but you got to understand that everywhere we look around us uh, implies that we're in a spherical universe because we're seeing the cosmic microwave background. So that implies that this sphere is around us. However, <clears throat> it's also possible that we're only able to see out to the cosmic microwave background, but you ask a question about what's beyond that. <laughs> we know that there's more universe. We know that the light time that it takes the light to get to us, and here is the real killer. The light time that it takes to get to us is such that we see out 13.8 billion light years. That means 13.8 billion years of time it took the light from way out by the cosmic microwave background to get to us. But if you really think about it, it means that in that time, universe has still expanded for 13.8 billion more years than the time it took that light to get to us. And we know that it's accelerating outward as it goes. So what does that mean? It means that we have a problem to consider. That problem you just hit is... Ten, I'm sorry. I'm doing it now, yeah. And that's right. okay. That problem is that at that distance... And accounting for the acceleration of the universe, the universe is not, okay, basically, you know, 40 light years in diameter, okay, uh, or in radius, okay, or 40 in, in diameter, rather. It's actually um, 92 billion light years in diameter, considering the expansion, right? So we can't see past a certain distance. We can see the light from the cosmic microwave background that's made it to us from that far, far distance. But in that time, the universe has still been expanding. So what's out here is stuff we will never see. Hmm. It's a mind bender. It really is. I've heard uh, that before. I don't know if I hold with that. Um, it, yeah. It's all idle speculation. I... No, really uh, one, I, one I've wondered about, uh, you hear, uh, this is like conjecture about time and time travel, space travel, dimensional travel. Uh, hello, David Schmidt. Um, hey, David. People who vanish into thin air, mm -hmm. so to speak. I've read stories, you know, I don't know if it's closer to ghost stories or what, but uh, people supposedly vanish into thin air. Uh, where did they go? Did they go to another dimension, another plane? Uh, I remember w oh. at least one where somebody, you know, like they're out in the middle of a field and they vanish and you go back there once a year and you can hear them screaming or something. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all buggity-boo to me. 
Well, that's that's different. Know. That's a paranormal but, thing. By the yeah, way, for folks, yeah. notice there's some clouds. Just so you know. So I thought I thought that's why this last exposure was turning bright. We have some clouds coming through. Uh, unfortunately. Maybe that. I mean, we stopped though. So let me uh, save this. It might be buggity boo to you, Daryl, but um, it might also be uh, it might be something that has merit if we could study it further. I think, first of all, the whole concept of multiple universes is relatively sound. Actually, there's a lot of astrophysical journal articles that actually talk about parallel universes uh, from the point of view of the missing mass. I mean, we need to have more mass in our universe in order to be able to uh, have had a big bang and so maybe what we were was just sort of like a little pop off of a much bigger bang <laughs> yeah you know, so, and that's something that has to do with the amount of mass that's available to make the universe um, so that's I've, kind of mm, I've that? wondered uh, you know if aliens <clears throat> are really here <clears throat> Uh, and if they're humanoid, though not human, you know, they look like us, but they're not us. And, you know, they're, they're bipedal, uh, bilateral symmetry and all that things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they still look vaguely human, that if maybe it's not a matter of space travel so much as, you know, they came from uh, the future, perhaps, when they have evolved into something other than human. But it's all, well, see, you that's, know, what if. Yeah. You see, that's the problem I have. And that is that I honestly don't believe that you can have uh, time travelers, per se. I don't believe that's possible. Um, although I'm, I'm, I'm alone in that, if you consider... Uh, there's one physics professor at the University of Connecticut here in, in this state uh, who actually believes that time travel is, is something that can be achieved. Um, and uh, he actually built a time machine. All right, his name is Ronald Mallet, and uh, he's a smart guy. Uh, but his time machine requires that it be on for the entire time that you want to go back to. So if you turn it on today, you can't go back to yesterday. You can only go back to today. Mm -hmm. And what does go back mean? It doesn't mean you can go back and relive or experience, but you can maybe get information from that time that gives you a complete picture of what was happening. So I'm not really sure how his time travel process works, but it's interesting. We have high clouds, by the way, just so you know. Bummer. Yeah, that's got pretty bad right there. Yep. Are they going to blow through? I don't think so. I think this was something I... Well, you know what? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to... I'm going to... Take us over look to at our... Windy. There we are. Hey, right. And let's see. So here's what's coming through. See that? So we got a good deal of time in before these clouds popped in on us. Uh, oh. We got we got these out. We got the, we got what we had to get done. Yeah, I saw that coming in several, earlier tonight. Yeah, I saw it, and, I, and it was it was like as soon as it saw me, it started going faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I saw it earlier this evening. Uh, like when you yeah. first contacted me about tonight, it was all over yeah. on the California side of the border. Mm -hmm. Oh well. Oh well, indeed. All right. Well, hey, you know what? It wasn't a bad night, now was it? I had a, a, a very good time with you guys tonight, and thank you, Daryl, for uh, being available to come out and check oh, sure. things out. And uh, we'll do this again when it's clear, which could be as soon as uh, tomorrow night. I'm not sure if we're going to do a Sky Tour radio show tomorrow. I'm going to see if I can write it. I have a lot going on, but I'm going to try and get to it.
We have a lot oh. to talk about too, including Mars. Like you said, there we had a, a whole yeah. thing Mars that was pretty cool. Oh, well, maybe we could just wing it. We tried that a while back, and I thought it worked pretty good. Yeah, we can try it. We could try it. Okay. All right. Well, let me know. Well, it's been fun, and thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, cool. We got some nice shots. Only this very last shot of M78 might M78 four might be a bust on us, but that's okay. And just as far as the the uh, files go, let's take a look. Well, as you can see, they're uploading. So we are getting our files uploading to the server. These are going up as we speak. Um, and even after I disconnect, they're still going up. So hopefully we can see that they're going up on the server. Darn it all. I really wanted to have some more fun, but okay. I get it. I get it. All right, folks. Well, look. Um, tell you what we'll do. Uh, we're going to. Uh, we're going to definitely uh, call it for tonight. Obviously, it's not the best of the nights as of as not as of now. It night got pretty bad on us, and we will actually uh, come back at a, another time. So, hope you guys have a good night. Thanks for coming. It was good to see you. Say good night, Daryl. <laughs> good night, Daryl. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but I'm bummed. Okay, John. Hi, Gracie. Yeah, right. Good night, Gracie. Uh, sorry, Isabella. Hey, but it makes your job easier, Isabella, because now you don't have a whole lot to, a lot more to, to. Uh, put out for table of contents right <laughs> thanks guys and uh, we'll catch you the next time we stream so we'll see you later good night good night